you, um, this is the first time that you've been to the Black Earth. It's our show of you. All right, awesome. So we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to spend time with us this evening. For those of you who may not know, very quickly, the Black Archive was started back in 1974 by a gentleman named Horace Peterson III. And Mr. Peterson felt that it was very important to understand how uh, vital the contributions of African Americans have been to the evolution of Kansas City. And he started that work uh, back in the late 60s and early 70s. And from spending time with elders in the community, began to uh, connect with them in such a way that they entrusted him with their collections. And when I say collections, I mean several of them had uh, old newspapers, uh, important photographs and documents that really help people to understand um, how important uh, Kansas City's African American history was. And so he opened the original archives back in 1974. And he felt that people who wanted to research that history and to understand that story needed a repository for that. And so that was his initial goal. So we were primarily a research institution. We moved into this space uh, back in 2012. And uh, along with us being an institution for research, we are also uh, a space where you can find incredible exhibitions. So we've got a permanent exhibit it's called With My Eyes No Longer Blind, and it covers the period uh, from 1850 to 1991 with the election of Mayor Emanuel Cleaver II, Kansas City's first African American mayor. I should also mention that our collection uh, is the inspiration for our exhibition. So the material that you would find in our collection covers that same time period, primarily from 1850 to 1991. Then we also do public programs, and so, uh, which is why you're here tonight. Mr. Peterson's philosophy that was that you know it's very important to understand history, so that we can do a better job of grappling with the issues that we're confronted with in the present, so that we can hopefully project a better future for our children and generations to come. So, uh, with that in mind, the programs that we do uh, not only cover African American culture from a historical perspective try to also deal with things that are going on in contemporary culture as well. And so if you are interested in learning more about the archives, feel free to talk to me. Um, our archivist and historian, Jerry Sanders, is in the back. Wave at the nice people, Jerry. Uh, Jerry Sanders. We've got our director of operations in the far back, Mr. Uh, Emil Cleaver. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about the archives, you can talk to any of the three of us. We also have a sign-up list in the back if you wanted to receive emails from us letting you know about future programming and other things that are going on at the archive. So, tonight, as I said, we're very excited. We've got a very special evening in store. Um, but before we get to uh, the main event, uh, we have a special guest that I would like to introduce, and his name is Steve Penn. And Steve Penn has been a huge advocate for the district. He worked at the Kansas City Star, was a columnist there, an award-winning columnist for 31 years, and became involved uh, in learning more about Pete O'Neill and his struggle as a Black Panther and the things that he had gone through, um, and, and, and really became an advocate for him, so much so that he wrote a book called Case for a Pardon, and he's going to be talking a lot about that this evening. Uh, but in terms of this district, uh, Mr. Peterson was one of the people who felt like not only should there be a black archive, but he understood the importance of jazz and baseball uh, as it pertained to Kansas City's African American history. He understood how vital the 18th and Vine uh, district had been during the era of segregation. I mean, in spite of segregation and all the obstacles that we confronted during that period in time, this community was a thriving community. There were so many African-American scholars and artists and musicians, obviously, and, and entrepreneurs uh, that this area rivaled uh, Black Wall Street in Tulsa. And Mr. Peterson really felt like uh, there should be an effort to revitalize the district. And you know, he was one of the uh, four 
foremost uh, authorities and advocates for the Negro League Baseball Museum, the American Jazz Museum. So this whole district had a lot to do with what Mr. Peterson had envisioned. And Mr. Penn has been a huge advocate uh, as, as a writer uh, for the district and ultimately now uh, for, for Pete O'Neill. So uh, we thought that it only fitting to, to have him be a special guest tonight and then um, he will take on the responsibility of introducing our featured speaker. So please put your hands together for Mr. Steve Penn. And also, you got a radio show. When does the radio show come on? Uh, Fridays at 1 p.m. KPRT. Yeah, Friday, 1 p.m. KPRT. You all need to listen to that. All right, here you go, Steve. Thank you, Randy. Uh, Appreciate you very much. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, say that I was a very good friend of Horace Peterson uh, when I was a reporter at the Star. He was one of my very good sources. Uh, Love to chat with Horace. Um, he was just a wonderful, funny, funny guy, and always had the scoop on what was going on in Kansas City. So he and I became very good friends. Um, I'm Steve Penn. I'm a local writer. Uh, I'm the former columnist and reporter for the Kansas City Star. In 2012, I called up Pete O'Neill in Africa. And uh, I asked him if I could come visit him in Arusha, Tanzania. Um, I explained to him that I had already started a book about him. I had written, a, took about 100 pages with me um, on my journey. And I uh, arrived in 20, uh, February of 2012 in Arusha. Um, we set on Pete's patio, uh, which is legendary, uh, and we discussed uh, my book. Um, he liked this, he didn't like that. I put in things, I took out things. Um, we spent a month working on my book, um, and when I returned, uh, we published it. Um, the book starts with really two stories. It's Pete O'Neill and Charlotte's life before they left Kansas City and in Pete O'Neill's life with Charlotte after they left Kansas City. So it's, it's two halves. Um, uh, they did many things, and I'll give you just one instance, and it'll kind of give you an indication of the kind of activism that they were involved in. Um, uh, they, um, it was a church in Kansas City, and it was located in the African American community. This church would not allow African Americans to become members of this church. Uh, Pete O'Neill heard about that, and um, a couple of members came to him and to Pete that you know, this church is, wouldn't allow African Americans to become members. Um, and Pete, at first, was sort of reluctant. Uh, but then the members explained to Pete that this is a church uh, located in the heart of the black community on Linwood. And Pete started to listen. Um, she, they explained uh, that. Um, this particular church would not allow African Americans to become members. Uh, she explained that she had gone to church a couple weeks before and couldn't become a member of this particular church. Anyway, um, Pete O'Neill uh, decided to take some action. And when Pete O'Neill took some action, he took some action. Um, he um, decided to march on this particular church. And uh, actually what he did was he went to the church the next Sunday with two Black Panther members and they uh, very quietly went up to the pastor and gave him their list of demands. Uh, they explained to them that uh, 
one of them was that the church was was required to uh, give a certain amount of their money to uh, <laughs> the community. Anyway, uh, the <coughs> church uh, said, yeah, would, would you please come back another Sunday? Turned around and walked away. But they came back the next time. And the next time. And the next time. Finally, they returned one. They returned Easter Sunday. <laughs> and in the middle of Easter uh, services, they complained with the pastor that, you know, they really were in a dialogue that they really wanted to hear the man's name. One of them was that the church, like I said, would, would give a portion of their money to the community. Um, pastor said, hey, look, um, it's Easter Sunday. Come back the next Sunday, <laughs> and we'll deal with the name of the So very reluctantly, Pete O'Neill left and went back home. But did return the next Sunday. Um, on that particular Sunday, he brought more of the samples with him. Uh, Kansas came in and they surrounded the perimeter of the church. Um, and uh, they explained that no one was leaving until a discussion about their demands were met. Anyway, the pastor, he wasn't there deal with this. So Pete O'Neill uh, went to the podium uh, where he snatched the microphone from the pastor. Um, anyway, a discussion between one of the Panther members, a, a, a woman named Donna, who was the enforcer. So she, um, she got into a dialogue with a very large woman in the church. Um, who had a pretty good right hand. Anyway, uh -oh. they, uh, they, they continued to dialogue until, uh, until uh, she struck uh, down. That was a bad, that was a bad move. Uh, because at that moment, a melee ensued. I'd like to tell you that it was just sheer pandemonium. Um, Punches were thrown. Um, like I said, it was sheer pandemonium. Um, anyway, um, that's how that moment went down. It is just one of many, many, many moments uh, in the life of Pete O'Neill. But it is one very illuminating moment. Um, eventually, um, the Panthers um, decided that they would uh, contact um, uh, Pete O'Neill and they would discuss issues within the community. Mm -hmm. Finally, um, what, what, what the, the, the Panthers eventually, um, upon, after this fight started, they heard a siren and they fled into the street <laughs> where they heard a siren. Um, uh, Pete O'Neill quickly thinking saw the cab, flagged the cab, and inside the cab they ran four or five members inside the cab. Um, as a result, they got about a block. Of course the police surrounded the cab, pulled the Panthers out, arrested them all. It is just one of many, many moments uh, within the Black Panthers. Uh, let me read you <coughs> of my book that pertains to this particular moment. Donna, Donna, Pete O'Neill screamed, stop, stop. Donna ignored Pete's pleas and continued to choke the woman. Um, in, a, in an effort to prevent further harm to the breathless woman, uh, one of the Panthers uh, came and the man lifted his hand to strike Donna, but, that, uh, but that's as far as he got. Donna's husband 
Elijah, a committed camper, countered the blow, knocking the parishioner to the floor. A group of people from the church began rushing to Kansas. From that moment on, in that small Methodist church on Linwood, all hell broke loose. A wild battle ensued in pandemonium. Rude, undisputed Pete O'Neill said it was seen. News photographers were ducking and dodging and trying their best to film the action. The Panthers were fighting members of the congregation in the aisles, on the floors, <laughs> under pews, and even in the balcony. A man ran up to Pete O'Neill while, while he stood on the pulpit, snatched the American flag from the metal stand, and then rushed Pete. Then he began strangling Pete from behind with it. Almost instantly, three Panthers jumped from behind, jumped the, the gentleman from behind. As Pete struggled free, another man came running up with his fist clenched. Pete O'Neill defended himself by dropping him. The melee went on for three or four minutes until the wailing from the police sirens could be heard. Hey, the police are coming, O'Neill yelled to the Panthers. Get out of here fast. <laughs> the Panthers began to run. Just as the Panthers began to make their way out of the building, the exit slammed shut. Police were not allowed to fire their weapons to be tied up inside of a sanctuary, which was very lucky. It was also crowded because they would have. It was so crowded that police weren't able to use their night sticks effectively. Not enough elbow room, I guess. <laughs> That's when O'Neill spotted Charlotte, his wife, in the midst of the brawl. Let's head for the door, he shouted. They battled their way out, punching and kicking folks uh, and police that stood in their way. Everyone who made it out started running down the street. After sprinting for several blocks, Pete O'Neill quickly determined what kind of shape he was in, or better, which kind of shape he was in. He was winded, but he forced his body to keep going. The Panthers ran inside St. Joseph Hospital through a ground level entrance. A hospital guard pulled a gun from his holster as Pete O'Neill ran past. Halt! Halt! He shouted. No way, O'Neill said as he made a sharp turn into the hallway before breaking into a full out sprint. We realized that if we had obeyed his order to stop, he most certainly would have shot at least one of us. Uh, and it was clear that none of us had any weapons, Pete recalled. Mm -hmm. We ran from door to door, room from room. As they ducked in one room and out, doctors and nurses stood mortified as they interrupted surgery in progress. Mm -hmm. O'Neill began to wonder if they were just running around in circles. That's when he started the Prospect Avenue exit. They hurried out the door, but by the time police uh, police were everywhere, a helicopter was circling overhead as they ducked into a dark abandoned uh, garage. When they heard the sound from the helicopter drifting in the distance, they slowly came out. A patrol car with red lights flashing turned the corner, but the officer didn't spot them clearly. The taxi was waiting at the light uh, to, ch to turn for the corner. They seized the opportunity. All seven Panthers jumped inside the cab at the same time. <laughs> anyway, um, in the 1990s, uh, Charles O'Neill, he checked with the State Department and determined that there weren't any uh, charges against her, uh, and that that would prohibit her from traveling to the U.S. So she flew here with her son Malcolm X and her daughter Stormy. I actually wrote the very first story uh, when she returned. Um, she came here and has been coming here ever since. Um, as a result of charges that came about in 1969-70, Pete O'Neill was charged with carrying a weapon across state line. It was a uh, charge because uh, he had already been convicted of a felony, thus uh, this existing 
felony contempt of carrying a weapon, uh, the charges were 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 just that he was a, a felon carrying a weapon. Uh, albeit he did not have the weapon on him when the weapon was even found. The weapon was even found on another gentleman. Anyway, not to mention the weapon didn't even work when the police found the weapon. And to make a long story short, they sold the weapon to another gentleman. The police had to recover the weapon to charge Pete O'Neill. Anyway, um, Charlotte has been coming to the United States ever since, and she has been uh, spreading her own uh, sort of ministry as Mama Speaks. If you have not seen her documentary, I suggest you go see Mama Speaks, Urban Warriors in the African Bush. Uh, she is a superstar. She is a legend. Uh, she is my friend. She is a mother. She is a poet. She is an actress. Um, she is a mother. I would see 22 Wakota. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I give you the world famous superstar, Mama C. But before she comes up, she has a book that she is selling in the back. Uh, it is called uh, Slices of Life, uh, Mama C, uh, Magic. Anyway, it's back to $50. Uh, but I wanted to say about her book that I published her, her poetry book myself. I have a publishing company, and we published her book very gladly, and it is my uh, second book that I have published as well. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I give you Mama C.
but elegant still as she took her last breath and settled her face into a smile. Mm -hmm. My mother's hands. Elegant, gnarled, smooth, cracked, <coughs> rough, moist, strong, limp, soothing, creative, at rest. My mother's hands. Hands full of love. greatest inspiration in my life. We've been together since I was 18 years old, and I'm 65 now, so you can, you can count that. Almost 50 years. That blows my mind with the blessing, because it seems like time has just gone by so fast, you know? She's the love of my life. Right. I gotta share this. <laughs> He's the love of my life, the love of my life, a man who is faithful and true. You, the love of my life, I tell him that always, mm -hmm. the right. love of my life and I, oh, who I am. You told me from the beginning. I remember you told me from the very start, you said that there must be unquestionable loyalty if I was to try to have your heart. You set a strong and constant example for the young, naive girl that I was. You were then my, mm, yeah, my older man, full of life experiences, wisdom, and strong love. You taught me so, so very much, so very much, that I had not envisioned before. You gave me courage, and you inspired me with your Panther swag. You made my dreams cruise beyond American shores. I remember the new year of 69, or maybe 1970, I suppose. We stood at the window of our little flat, looking out the dark,
My mom taught me so much, and I just praise her so much all the time. And <coughs> one of the things she taught me and my dad was to be myself, mm -hmm. to honor who I am, to honor our history. Mm -hmm. And I have carried that with me all of these 65 years. Mm -hmm. Mom also taught me how to arch my eyebrows and my own jewelry. And I want to share this one because I think some, sometimes society puts things on us that shouldn't be on us. Sometimes society tells us who we need to be, right. how we need to yes, dress. Yes, that's right. You know, mm -hmm. society say you shouldn't have had that thing in your nose. Mm -hmm. But right. it's what I like. That's it's right. what I like. That's right. Right. It's what marks me. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Society, I can remember when I was 18 years old, I grew up in uh, Kansas City, Kansas. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I've lived outside of America for, ooh, 40, well, since 1970. I never lost my Kansas accent. <laughs> <laughs> and I embrace that. You know, because it's a part of who I am. And I love that. And I'm going to actually share one from another book because this is my other book. <laughs> and this is one that I never, ever get tired of saying. I love this poem because all of us at some point feel like we need to change ourselves to fit in mm -hmm. and to please other people. Mm -hmm. Some point in our lives, right. mm -hmm. it might be for five minutes, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> but I felt like that for many, many years when we first went to Tanzania in 1972. <coughs> I wanted to be a purely African woman. I didn't want anybody putting a hyphenated Amer African American American, African, I just wanted to be African, mm -hmm. huh? To the point where I felt the need to change who I was, mm -hmm. to change myself, mm -hmm. to change my history. Mm -hmm. And I almost lost myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It used to amaze me that even though free dreadlocks <laughs> Dressed in cotton from head to toe, carrying my babies on my back, basket on my head, chewing sugar cane sticks and pepper sprinkled mojo rope, just like everybody else. Before I even opened my mouth to speak, they could somehow tell that I was someone else, different, other I couldn't hide it even though I tried and I almost lost myself. Self. Self. In my freshly landed, just got off the boat enthusiasm of living in Africa, I tried to blend, to melt, homogenize, disappear, erase the essence of what made me who I was and am, an African who grew up in and was molded by the hoods of America Amen. and Amen. almost lost myself. Self. Self. I almost lost that distinctive stride that signals a yank from here. <laughs> 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 I almost lost my fair laughing in your face mustard tone before. <laughs> and my hands on here, finger waving, snake charming. You ain't got to tell me I can't snatch me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
as rich and as valid as anyone born with the dust of our African ancestors squished lovingly between their baby toes. I learned to remember that the middle passage memories still twisting in my DNA, causing frequent bouts of claustrophobic episodes, are as real as the recollections of those who had never been ripped from the reassuring womb of family and history and language and food and religion. Religion. I learned to remember, y'all, that the French etymology of my name was just as valid and honorable and blessed as Habiba or Amina or Aisha. Because <laughs> it was given to me in love by those who loved me and marked me as surely as the eternally swollen scarification cut of a Dinka lady. I learned to reject feelings of embarrassment at having been born an African in America, mm -hmm. off land, <coughs> offshore, thousands of miles off course from where I might have been had those captors not had such a pressing need mm -hmm. for dark rum mm -hmm. and cotton gin. Mm -hmm. I learned to remember and bring honor to the fact that, hey, I'm still the fly in the ointment, mm. the lump in the clotted cream, the wrinkle in the dried cloth, that hard green pea under the stack of mattresses. <laughs> and after having lived in Africa for more than 40 years, I'm still different, set apart, Negro, but hey, it no longer bothers me that folks still ask me, even after I've explained that I've lived in a village in the heart of Wameru homeland in Africa for years and years and years, probably even before they were born. <laughs> it no longer bothers me, I tell you, when they say in response to my explanation, uh-huh, yeah. yes, I do understand that, but... Watch out. Here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes, but where are you? Walk down the street, 
My sister probably experienced this too. There were so many people who had never, ever seen black people before. And I'm telling you, sometimes it would almost cause accidents because people would be on their motor scooters and, and their cars and they forget they were driving and look at me, you know? And I didn't interpret it as racism. I really, really didn't. You know, you can feel racism. You always know that that's going on. I looked at it as curiosity, you know? And so when people would come up to me and want to take my picture, and nobody tried to feel my hair. <laughs> you know how sometimes, you know, people say, they tried to feel my hair. Nobody tried that. And I was very happy for that. But they were curious. They just would look at me, you know. And uh, I was actually proud. I was proud, and I walked proud. And I remember what my parents taught me, you know. Yeah. I'm a hip hop. <laughs> Conscious hip hop. But still genteel. I'm old school. But I still keep it real. I serve up thick slices of freedom shout. I want them international Africans. <laughs> Asian cultures run up in my veins. Powerful voices. Bust through chains like hot buttered knives. I'm one of them international Africans. I'm one of them international Africans who you might have caught glimpses of on the news. We are the ones who are comfortable speaking in any language, in any culture, because our spirits got flow. Like the blue. We speak French with a Senegalese accent. We speak Kiswahili with a Midwestern drawl. <laughs> I'm liable to greet you with a ni hao, my friend, or bid you adieu with a tutanani, y'all. The outside of me reflects that inside DNA that twists and turns in creatively unique ways like Head beats from Cape Town, the Lekes from New Africa. I sport paper beads from Uganda, Labrette pierced in Nairobi, Kenya. I'm comfortable picking up tofu with my chopsticks or eating ugali with my finger. I did strong hip hop vibes in any language, and I appreciate beauty in all colors and genders. I am compelled to honor my eight gurus in all the ways that I've learned. I cut off my locks and sacrificed to my Orisha, marking bridges that I've burned. Scarification cheek marks from Unko No, chin tattoo from Kansas City. I walked in the streets of Shanghai, China, heavily cloaked in black pride and African dignity. All right. All right. I did my long earrings from Joe Bird and my gown and shawl, a gift from Ghana. I dress all of my fingers and some of my toes <laughs> with power rocks and brass and copper armor. Rap stones from Indianapolis, Chicago, Baltimore, and D.C. Sunshine colored conga from Tanzania and ankle bracelets from traditional Maasai. Yeah. The essence and bliss of my inside is reflected on my outside. It's true. I am a citizen of the planet. Your mother earth is my mother too. And I walk the way of the new world, embracing the good of the old world too.
So Nikiki La L Y R E. Nikiki is spelled N Y A P I T I, and it comes from the Luo community in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And this is carved out wood. This is not a gourd, so it's pretty heavy, huh? And thank you. I painted it myself. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it's an eight-string lyre, so it's a kambanani. Uh, this, I always ask people to guess what this is, because you ain't going to never guess what it is. This is what adheres the bamboo, um, um, what do you call this? The strut bridge, that's what you call it, to the skin. Can anybody possibly guess what this is? Is what tar? It looks like tar, and this is the natural color, but it ain't tar. Rubber. It's what? Rubber. No. It's what? Chewing gum? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give you one more. Is it elephant dung? No. 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 I give you one. Okay. I'm going to give you one. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> instrument 
that mm -hmm. a man who has passed away would give. Wow. So, you know, in a, in a, without causing offense, but in a patriarchal society, mm -hmm. right. you know, men kind of, you know, keep things to themselves mm -hmm. sometimes. Even in some communities, women weren't allowed to play drums. Mm -hmm. You know, but now you got some of the baddest drummers on the planet mm -hmm. who are women. So, uh huh. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. And so, when I learned this, I learned Obacano first, which is, it's a lyre also, and it's a string, but it's bigger than this, and it has a buzzing sound. And the brother who taught me this was a young artist, a young musician. His name is Grandmaster Masesa, much younger than me. Uh -huh. But he taught me because he saw that. He saw my, 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 my thirst for wanting to learn to play this. I was so, I'm very drawn to string instruments, especially traditional instruments, you know. I got a bass waiting for me at home, but I, yeah, yeah. But I haven't learned to really play it yet. Uh, one day I'll play like my brother Shane. <laughs> yeah, but right now I can't. I'll stick to these. So let me just play a little something for y'all. All right. <laughs> Sometimes it just gets to be too much, too much heartbreak, too much sorrow. But we must also celebrate the positive mm -hmm. in order for us to keep strengthening each other. The violence and terror and fascism are not the only things in our lives. That's right. We are also creative and inventors, and artists, and knowers of the highest degree. Mm -hmm. That must always be acknowledged and embraced. It is who we are. We must not forget that. We must have examples of light that people can embrace and get courage from. And artists are often at the forefront of that. We must never stop celebrating the God that is in all of us. Don't let oppression and fascism take our joy away, y'all. They want to keep us in despair, knowing that defeats and depletes our spirit to fight against evil. Even in the midst of fighting back, we must experience joy. It is what charges our collective batteries. Never let them take away our joy. That's right. Even that is resistance. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You haven't put your hand up yet, have you? Y'all sure y'all hear that?
we're gonna say. We walk, we walk, we walk, we walk, we walk, we walk, the way of the new world. Hey, we walk, we walk, we walk, we walk. I have a list. I don't know 
know what happened to my list. But you know, sometimes I like to like just let spirit know what I want to share, you know? And uh, this is some of my reflections. I need some reading glasses. <laughs> wow. It's every year. I'm cool, though. <laughs> every year, it gets farther. It's so something. We were thinking about the whole of the quarters. Wait 10 years, baby. Yeah? And, uh, I had just finished looking at the edited version of one of the numerous interviews that I uh, did during the UAAC Heal the Community Tour 2014. I like the way that even the television newscasters in the piece, who are notorious for twisting words and the truth, Amen. couldn't help but say that, quote, Pete O'Neill chose to leave America and not go to prison for something that he did not do. I continue to be inspired by the out-of-the-box thinking that prompted that decision mm -hmm. in 1970. That's when we left. Mm -hmm. A sister said to me after the Kansas City combined launching of my brother Steve Penn's book, mm -hmm. A Case for a Pardon, and the April premiere screening of the Joanne Hirschfield documentary, Mama C. Urban Warrior and the African Bush, at the Bruce R. Watkins Cultural Center in Kansas City, she said, it's amazing that Brother Pete thought to leave not only the city, but the country, way back when many people did not think out of the box about possibilities. I wholeheartedly agree. It took an uncommon initiative to take advantage of the networks of people strewn and organized around the world whose purpose <laughs> was to assist those using the international underground networks mm -hmm. rippling through many countries, reminiscent of the underground railroads right, right, right. that aided our people escaping from the bonds of slavery centuries ago. Right. It took courage to jump into those unknown waters of freedom and free will, and I continue to, to applaud my partner of more than four decades for having the insight to escape, not flee, mind you. Newscasters love using that word also. <laughs> but to leave America with a sense of free will and to live with a greater sense of freedom. It's that same out of the box way of thinking that saw us become successful pioneers living off the land learning different approaches to life through appropriate technology while honing our creativity and inventiveness during the many years when there was so much we couldn't get ready made in Tanzania. My reflections continue to astonish me as I recall how Brother Pete's strength and example moved us forward to make a blessed life in a totally different environment of language and culture, and food, and nature, and people in general. It has taken a sustainable sense of courage and ingenuity to not only survive, but to thrive over these many years of Brother Pete's exile, building on lessons learned as Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. It's been a natural, organic progression of our community-minded thinking that culminated in the birth of the United African Alliance Community Center and community outreach programs like the Leaders of Tomorrow Children's Home. The years have not always been easy, but I feel a sense of successful revenge against the system that caused Brother Peace exile and the imprisonment of so many of our comrades. What could have turned out to be a living hell of exile and regret turned out to be a blessing, mm -hmm. not only for us, but for the hundreds, I dare say thousands, of people
people who have been able to absorb some of the energy and love and lessons learned from Brother Pete and the UACC as a whole. As revolutionaries, it is our duty to work the system in ways that could be advantageous. I feel blessed to have been in Brother Pete's life for nearly five decades, and I give thanks. My comrade, Brother Pete O'Neill, AKA Babu, that means grandfather, <laughs> continues to inspire me. So I mentioned those two people. Uh oh, uh oh. I'm at the end. Let me say it real quick. Okay, cool. But okay, I just got to tell them though some news about uh, the leaders of tomorrow children's home. We've been raising. 22 to 23 children for the last eight years. When they first came to us, they were quite small. Now the first, uh, the oldest girl, Irene, she just graduated with honors, wow. secondary school, now she's getting ready to go to university. She is number one in her school, plus she was number eight out of six schools in the whole Arusha region uh, of 283 uh, uh, very special children. Huh? Yeah. Uh, happiness, yes, yes. And I, I just put pictures of her and some of our other uh, young people on Facebook. Uh, this adverse <laughs> my Facebook page is Charlotte Hill on me. Right. <laughs> and many of y'all are my Facebook friends. And uh, Brother Pete is Pete O'Neill. And then we have a website, www.uaac. Dot net, and uh, you can see some of the work that we're doing there. So we have daily classes for youth in our community in many subjects of uh, language, uh, focusing on English, because many people want to learn English there. The, the, um, the official language is Kiswahili and English, and plus a hundred and something other languages, not dialects. Mm -hmm. But Kiswahili is the cementing language, and I credit uh, Julius K. Nereri, who was the uh, founding president of, of Tanzania with that, with having the insight to encourage people to learn Kiswahili. Many of y'all know Kiswahili, you might not know it, mm. especially those of us who grew up in the 60s and had naturals, and a commercial <laughs> used to come on, Watu Wazuri,
Kansas City is still home. Yeah. You know, and, and I just love that that Kansas City flavor. So I give thanks, I give thanks to a Black Archives of, of Middle America for, for hosting me and, and, and for being so so down with the community. That's right. You know, I say right on for to y'all. You know, and you all the sixties, y'all know right on. Yeah. <laughs> and I also like to say we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Black Panther Party. And uh, 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 Brother Jermaine Thomas is is uh, premiering, he's having the Kansas City premiere of a film he's been working on called Legacy Spirit of the Black Panthers. And he screened it actually Saturday. I can't remember the college though. Where? Say it again. Two o'clock at Penn Valley. Is that Penn Valley? Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, I got the email from Rob. All right, all right. So, so it's a very good film, and it's going to have the California premiere uh, uh, in California during the Black Panther celebrations. And I'll be performing there. I'll be doing workshops there, along with a whole bunch of Panthers, even some of the international Panthers. A lot of people don't know there was uh, Panthers in New Zealand. There were Panthers in India. There were Panthers in England. So it's going to be a very international. We wow. had uh, Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. here in March. Wow, yes, yes, I saw. He's such a good brother. Yes, yes. Chairman Fred, he's carrying on the legacy. Yes, right. yes. yes, Steve. I have one more announcement. Um, Charlotte will be traveling to Oakland where she will be receiving a national award from the alumni of the National Black Panthers. So we have time for maybe two or three questions. I know you probably have a million of them, but I just also wanted to mention the Mama C has books for sale in the back. We want to make sure we send her out of here empty handed. And I know that you all are going to want to have time to have her sign them and things like that. So if we can limit it to two or three questions starting. All right, he jumped the gun. We got him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Black Lives Matter, 
They talk about all of that. They encourage us. And we can network. That is so, right. so very right. important. Right. So if you if you write me, I can I can hook you up with so many young people, especially. Well, are you an artist? I got a film yes, you up. I thought so. <laughs> yes, and we got a studio at home. Uh, right there at the center. So so many of them are so very observant about what's happening in the world and they encourage us. And maybe we can get some exchanges going. Like we used to have an exchange program with De La Salle Education Center okay. where some of them would go there and we would send right. we would send youth here. You know, and that's what it's about building. It's about nation building. You know. And I just am so proud that that so like Brother Dre Taylor, the project that he has yes. for these urban gardens, that yes. that's so powerful. And so many elders know how to grow food. So if we share that with the youth, you know, share our skills with the youth, you know, that's how we can do homegrown exchanges. Yeah, so write me, brother, yes, and my sister, and, and we'll we'll make some connections. Okay. Definitely. Thank you. I'll let yeah. you pick some last one. Okay. Steve was okay. here in case you have maybe one or two questions. I have, I have a question for Mr. Penn. Mr. Penn, uh, your book, uh, A Case for a Park. My pastor is a part of the Medicaid 23. Some people may know about that. And he preached to us a couple of months ago saying, you know, if why should, you know, you can mention the word pardon when you didn't do anything wrong. When, right. you, when you stand up for the rights of people. And so I understand the, the, the chapter of the book. The reason why I point that out is because I did some research. And the reason why uh, Mr. O'Neill had to get exiled in the first place because the Jagger Hoover had this surveillance program right, yes, that was yes. unconstitutional. Yes, it was yes. an unconstitutional, it was a group of white students from the, one of the Ivy League schools that broke into the headquarters back during what was doing Watergate Chat. Right. And they found out that document of the Cortel Pro program. Right. So we need to try to find a way to get Mr. O'Neill home for something he didn't do. What you're implying is um, <laughs> for a partner. <laughs> He would need to submit an apology. Yeah. He has done nothing wrong. Yeah, right. Thus, why an apology? Right. Um, I did speak today to Congressman Cleaver, so I knew that question would probably come up. Um, he has told me that um, it's all about relationships. He had a relationship with Eric Holder. Um, he does not have a very great relationship with uh, Loretta Lynch. And thus, uh, he was saying that he was going to end up having to start from the beginning with forging a new relationship with our next president, Hillary Clinton. And he plans on doing that. So, so your next book will be uh, Pete O'Neill's case is White Talk. White Talk. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. And then try to bring him back. You know, you want to give him his flowers now. Absolutely. And we are working on it. I mean, we don't think we're just idly by thinking that, you know, we're yes, actively, we know you better. actively working yes, on it. So. And you just thank you. Thank you. The brother back here in the cooper, you had a question, I think. You know, the question actually is a lot similar to my brother over here. But I was looking at the opposite. And I wanted to get to hear from others what they look back on all these years. And also, that African perspective. What is the thing that you can tell us here that is present in the state? What's the mistake that we need to avoid? Mm. Mm. That crab in the barrel syndrome. Wow. You know, we can be lifting each other up in all the ways that we can. If we were able to lift each other up, I'm talking about practically. You know, not like a some dream world. We can do it practically by supporting each other. You know, when we see somebody doing some, and I just keep going back to Brother Dre because I think that, that project is just so, it's so powerful. You know, we can support things like that. We can support mentoring youth. All of us got something that we don't have to wait on a big organization or none of that. It can be one on one. You know, and before you know it, it's a family, it's a neighborhood, it's a community. It used to be like that when I was growing up in Kansas City, Kansas, and it was probably like that here. 
you know, where we looked after each other, we supported each other, you know, I think that that is the way to walk away in the new world. I really, really do. You know, it's practical. Thank you. I think we should stop there, all right? And so, uh, Mama Sue, why don't you go have a seat? Okay. So we can get rid of your book. Oh. All right, all right. <laughs> all right, somebody just shared this. Yeah, one more hand for Mama Sue. making the connections that's what he's talking about he's like yeah oh excuse me man he's like everything's in a container he says no more containers we got to do it ourselves go to africa from africa come back from here back to africa i keep doing that he said, that's what we gotta do that's what we gotta do so yeah man so, just a lot like what you're doing man networking it's all about being international the clock's ticking on Babylon, man. Oh my goodness, man. The clock's ticking on Babylon. Uh, Putin just called all the Russians from the Vietnam War. He's called them home. So, and that's not just whatever. I know that from like the inside too. That's that's no joke. That drill that they went about. That's no joke. Forty million people. That's no joke. That's no joke. And China? That's not something we should take right. And the thing is, too, you know, Dr. Uh, Omar, Dr. Omar, Dr. Omar, he had a good point, man. I don't agree with everything he says, but he had a real good point. He talked about Chinese over, overseas being a lot of He's right. Sorry, you need to go pee pee? Right. Because, well, because the thing about it is, is I'm gonna have Bob there's a whole understanding. Like, I'm going to try to take him to the bathroom one more time because he didn't go earlier. Just, and he's going to probably go, come on. Who are you? I know. I was in Indianapolis. I was in Indianapolis. I was like, wait a minute, I've never been here. I know it was good, though. Yeah, it was cool. It was cool. But yeah, like, they. The, the thing is, you know, and this is what, this is what David Banner's talking about. It is one of the things where I'm like, you know, yeah. so, you know, 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 you
Ain't nobody know how to cook anything. Excuse me, nobody knows how to grow any food. Nobody knows how to start a fire. You did. You did. We can barely read. That's scary. We can barely read. That's the thing. That's the thing about the Chinese. And it's just pretty much a good thing. I think we need to wake up to it. It's not the fact that we're black. You know what I mean? But I think that's the thing I'm going to have. We don't, we don't participate in, in higher culture right, with it and everyone else. And, 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 and no, that's the thing. Like, yeah, I agree with, with Mama Susan. You know, yeah. We maybe play up the disdain of our brother and our brother. Right, right. We're like, bro. Right. I know they have. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not disagreeing with them. We got problems over here in the States, and that's why, they, that's why they keep that distance. Because we're not, Cause we're, we're broken, bro. Because that's the thing, we don't want to admit it too. Like, <laughs> we're broke almost the, beyond The scripture says in Proverbs, before honor comes humility. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and like, you and I were supposed to sit here, right? Like, we're coming from different religious traditions, but you and I are brothers. We right. can agree, you know what I'm right. saying? Right. We're educated. Right. We, we love our we families. See the we see the commonality. We see the see brothers here. We'll go down truth. Like, like I'm serious, man. Like that's our problem. Just like she said, that crap in the barrel thing. It's like I'll be, I'll be gladly take a side seat, and if, and if the most high is giving you a lead, I'll come alongside you, right? And support for the common, right? You know, that's that's our big thing. Man, Africanism is so crucial in that space. It is crucial. Yeah, it is crucial. But in order to understand that, I think this is the problem too. Is what do we bring into the pot besides anger? Right. And that's what right. that's what we need to work on. That's why her point is going to her. We got to mentor her. We got to I mean, these youth back, man. And I was talking to someone, I think it was the day, the generational problem. It's a gap, man. That it's, I was talking with Iman Bay about it. Because the youth now are so disconnected from their elders. They don't even know. My He's brother. Busy, my man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 All I did was uh, orchestrate. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? I ain't said that. <laughs> it's, 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 it's in the back. I know. I'm gonna have to do You know, brother Aaron, you know what I'm saying? first time meeting earlier uh, today. Uh, yeah, good brother. Man. Right, man. Yeah. He does tours, Kansas City. He does historical tours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, real rich mm -hmm. stuff, man. I need to get on that. Real rich stuff. What's up with you, man? Hey! What's up with you? Man! Yeah, yeah. Good to see you, man. Likewise, how you been? I'm hanging in here, man. Hey, getting older every day. Hey, right. None of us getting younger. And yeah, wiser, too. Man. I'm looking good, man. Looking good. Yeah. I'm looking good. What's up, brother? How you feeling? I'm good. How you feeling? All well. How are you? Uh, that's your sister in law, right? Yeah. 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 That's the reality of it. That's the reality of it. Hold on, let me ask you. How's it going, Bob? 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 How's it going, is it where it's across from St. Mark's? Mobile Bay, Mobile Bay. Oh, was it St. Stephen's? I went back there already. Yeah, I don't know. This was live here at the Black Archives with Mama Charlotte Hill O'Neill. This is Mikael Corbin, y'all, who's signing off live at Hebrew Vision. Shalom Aleikum.